My name is Whitney Lee. I'm the moderator for today's panel, putting the dev back into DevOps. It may just be the best one. Good choice. I'm also a developer advocate here at VMware. Joining me today, we have many talented and illustrious panelists. First up, we have Tasha Drew, who earlier today delivered an incredible presentation entitled Charming Pirates, which was about creating community and interest around your open source project. Nice to meet you, Tasha. Hannah Foxwell joins us too. Her talk, Blame DevOps, Shifting Left the Wrong Way, acknowledges that a lot of DevOps responsibility is being shifted to developers. And she gives some tips around how to utilize your cloud platform and cloud practices to address these extra responsibilities. Hello, Hannah. Hi. Also, Charity Majors is here. Hi. Charity is a co-founder and CTO at Honeycomb.io, a tool for software engineers to understand what happens when their code meets production. She also co-authored O'Reilly's Database Reliability Engineering. Hi. And finally, we have my friend and teammate, Layla Porter, who discussed learning in public, live coding on Twitch, and the plethora of, plethora of reasons that live coding is fun, both as a viewer and a coder. You've heard of pair programming? Well, today I learned a new term from Layla called mob programming. We have a full hour carved out for this discussion, but we intend to be pretty organic about it, go with the flow. So if it ends early, that's okay too. Do you have a question? Post your question to the panel discussion, putting Dev back into DevOps Slack channel. If you want, you can come on, join the screen with us, ask your question live. If you wanna do that, just note that when you're asking your question in Slack. And if you are the shy type and you don't want to come online, that's okay too. Put your question in Slack and I will be the one to read it to our monitors, uh, our panelists, excuse me. And I will do my best to treat your question right. And then finally, please stick around for the DevOps party games that are happening at 4.30 Eastern time. These will be fun and funny and don't worry, you won't be put on the spot as an audience member. Some of our panelists are going to be dropping out early to, to prepare for the party games. So if you do have a question, ask it sooner rather than later. So let's dig in on our first question. Um, were application developers ever really a part of DevOps? Or is the dev in there more about getting ops people to think like developers? What do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in there because I started on the dev side of DevOps. Um, I was embedded within a software development team. And I think the problems were felt on both sides of the fence and all around it at the beginning of, of the sort of DevOps movement or whatever we want to call it, the DevOps community. You know, we on the dev side were under pressure to ship small changes more frequently to deliver value to our users more frequently and we all understand and understood the sort of benefits that that could bring our users but we didn't understand the world of ops um we didn't have that empathy we didn't get why they kept saying no um and so i think from my point of view the dev was always in devos because ultimately it was about both increasing velocity, but also improving reliability and improving operability while we did it. Because, you know, as, as I said in my talk earlier, really, being a release manager for a failed release, that's not a fun experience. You know, whether you're in dev or in ops, uh, that's a problem for us all. Yeah, um, so if... So if I was to kind of uh, answer the question, um, the way that I've looked at it historically is DevOps is a super interesting movement that came out of um, a bunch of really talented sysadmins who were really frustrated in how uh, applications and services were worked on by a team that never never catered with the people who were actually running them in production. And so to trying to build this collaborative model between the two teams um, and starting look, 
We're not the sysadmin who you can just ignore all day. We use different tools from each other. Let's talk about the space between us. Let's talk about automation. Let's talk about how to make everybody's life significantly better. And so to me, like DevOps really came from the operations team, but a lot of the people within DevOps were developers who were trying to start to do infrastructure as code, um, platforms as a service, infrastructure as a service, and then start to create programmatic APIs and services so that you could start to really do all of this stuff in a repeatable, reliable manner. Um, then when I was, when the SRE movement started, what I found really interesting about that, at least if you read like the SRE book, is that that really kind of came the other direction. Um, and that was more, you know, we are computer science educated developers who have been hired and now have this role. We're doing site reliability engineers and they learned a lot from them. They also took like a slightly different perspective. And so usually like as a product manager, kind of looking at personas and like understanding how to talk to the two different groups, SREs do tend to have a computer science background, whereas practitioners tend to have more of an operations background. They have a lot of shared similarities, tools, and sort of perspective, um, but there does tend to be a, a That was great. Thank you. Um, our next questions from Scott Brightwell. Where do practitioners see CI CD tools being hosted? Are the CI tools distinctly separated from CD tools? Sorry, I, that, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, where are CI CD tools being hosted? You mean, are you running them in house or are you outsourcing them to a SaaS? And then are you are they asking about are CI tools different than CD tools? Like I, I'm not sure I follow. Uh, I can't speak to that. Um, what would make the most sense? Maybe we can take this from an educational right. perspective and sort of ask. Sure. You. I would say that absolutely uh, you should outsource your CI CD. You should have it someone else running it for the same reason that you know you should have somebody else running everything that isn't your core business model. Like, you know, if, if, mm -hmm. if it's not core to what makes you, you as a business, you should absolutely try mm -hmm. to, to spend as few developer cycles on it as possible, which means give it to somebody who does that as their core business model. Let someone else do it best so that you can do what you do best. Um, as for the part about separating CI from CD, I think there's an interesting question here about what does CD mean? Because uh, in, the, in the olden days, in the earlier days of CICD, um, it was used to mean continuous delivery, which was kind of a cop-out promise. It's like, oh, at the end of CI running, we're ready to run delivery at any time, but we're not actually going to do it because for good reasons, because like they were, they were you know, doing, using shrink-wrap software. They, they couldn't. And I feel like nowadays, now that we have the tools, we have the um, we have the knowledge, we have, we have, we've come a long way as, as an engineering community. And I think that it's now time to assert that CD absolutely does mean continuous delivery as a continuous deployment, as we are deploying to production continuously and automatically. And in that sense, you should never see, separate CI CD because as soon as you use, as soon as you have merged a change up to main, it should automatically kick mm -hmm. off and run CI CD. And you should be able to guarantee that your change will be in production within a few minutes of you making that change. Mm -hmm. There's no way. So CI, it. what I'm hearing is CID, CI and CD are, are they operate together, they happen together, but are there different, is there a different tool set, do you know, with CI versus with CD? I mean, sure. CI is running all of the tests, uh, all of the, mm -hmm. you know, test against your, your code and CD is delivering that software to production. So, you know, feeds and stuff. That's great. Thank you. And this is something Hannah touched on during her talk. Uh, whether we call them platform or DevOps, it seems like developers are the customers. That's something that Hannah said also today. What are the developers buying nowadays? Like what problems do they need to get solved? I mean, I think, uh... You solve as many problems as possible. Uh, it de really depends on the size of your team and your organization. So if you're in a very large organization, you want to invest in 
um, a, a centralized kind of developer platform and a capability around that, then you might be offering not just, you know, um, you know, a container as a service platform, for example, you might also be offering a, you know, monitoring as a service platform. You might be offering CI, CD tooling as a service in a kind of centralized model. Not everyone has that ability or that scale or the need to do it in that way. So I think everyone's, everyone's different. And, but I would say that, you know, depending on how many developers you have in your organization, you want to take that abstraction as high as you possibly can make it as simple and as easy as possible for them to do the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, let's make it as simple and as easy as possible to deploy safely without, without impacting um, availability. Let's make it as simple and as easy as possible to deploy securely or to ship operable software. But if you're Absolutely. in a tiny little startup, you've probably got one dev team and you might have I, you know, I would actually argue though that people. most teams most teams seem to think oh we don't need we don't need internal toolsmiths until until we get really big I think almost every team waits too long before having internal tools that that are aimed at nothing other than in, increasing the, the productivity um, and the autonomy of their their engineering teams because like like Coda Hale wrote you know like at best you can increase the productivity of your organization linearly as you hire more people at best. In reality, you also increase the complexity and you know the 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 stuff that's holding you back as, as you as you increase um, the number of developers as you have. And the only way to try and get ahead of that 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 really low curve is to try and constantly be investing in how can we help our developers internally move more quickly and more safely and more automatically. Just, just like what you were saying, Anna, I, I'm just like trying to say, I think that we need to like, you know, as soon as you have like two or three teams as, a, as, a, as an organization, it might be time to start investing in those internal. No, I, um, I, I, I will bits. agree with you there. I think I've seen too many people leave it too late to, to really make these investments. Uh, and it's very difficult to retrofit that into like, not just into your tool chain, but also into your culture as, as an organization, yep. you start to get that fear of production, which is um, yeah. so damaging to productivity. Mm -hmm. I can definitely See, attest kind of to thought, that. Yeah, I actually think the question was phrased in a really funny way to me because you asked, you know, what are developers buying? And usually the answer is developers don't buy anything. The people who are trying to empower them uh, to move quickly are buying stuff. And so kind of figuring out who you're talking to is really important. Um, the thing that keeps coming up in the community, in the Kubernetes community, where I'm part of SIG usability, we've been doing a big jobs to be done study that we'll be talking about at KubeCon last week. But the number one thing developers tell us when we talk to them about Kubernetes is they don't want to know they're on Kubernetes. They don't want to know anything about Kubernetes. Like, just let me do my job. If my job is at shipping a container, I'm happy. Um, and then the rest of this tooling ecosystem is really something that's like existing to enable the people who are then operating the applications and services at scale. Do you think, is that a reasonable request for developers to know zero about Kubernetes? Is that achievable? I mean, it's kind of on the size of your org, which I think is kind of what Charity and Hannah were referring to, right? Like, so when you see these smaller companies, um, in my experience, I've worked with a lot of startups. You have one dev team, one senior person will emerge who figures out enough to handle like operational complexity and no one else will help them. And you can watch that pattern like over and over again. It's like one person kind of dives in, figures it out, tries to usually train a couple other people, but everyone's so scared of messing up production that they would prefer to have nothing to do with it. And then as the org gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you end up being able to really separate those causes of concern. And a lot of people would prefer to really just have the simplest problem and building block possible to solve. Um, and because of the way we attach business value to the unique uh, application, instead of like the entire framework that delivers the application, you see this like differentiating cause of concern, like people will let it happen. Thanks. We have a question from Gabor Kiss. What, what is your opinion experience on the developers testing responsibility in the DevOps world? Do we need additional testers? I think there's several different, okay. 
Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I think there's several different approaches that I've seen to this, um, where teams have been getting rid of their testers or telling testers that they need to start becoming developers and developers need to start becoming testers to try and put that responsibility of it onto the developer that they test their own work. Um, yeah. I, I'm a developer, so I, I can speak for a developer. When I come to you testing, it's really, really hard to test your own code. You, you are blind to so much. Uh, so unless you have a culture where you're testing each other's, having a dedicated tester is really beneficial. But that, that doesn't mean that the developer should wash their hands of all testing. Um, but I think having that perspective where they're dedicated on testing is really important. Yeah, the way yeah, I, I, I kind of think of it is, is, is that you don't want to have, like when it comes to developers merging their code to main, shipping it to production, you don't want there to be any additional gates in there. You don't want it to have to go for a pass through QA or through security or any of that. Like you, it, you should get it out the code, get the code out the door with as few gates as possible. But there is a role for experts like security folks and, you know, testing experts to go along and do, you know, like, you know, pen tests and, you know, the equivalent for like, you know, looking at the code base as a whole and, and looking for other gaps and things that are need, need to be tested and like just sort of periodically auditing in that mm -hmm. auditing in, in that way. Like there are special specializations that we do need, but they can't get in the way of that loop or, or just like we all, it all grinds to a halt. That makes a yeah, lot of sense. I've seen sort of separate separated kind of teams specializing in things like, um, like you said, like security penetration testing, chaos, chaos engineering, even, which is, a, you know, a type testing, but um, like you said, it should not be a person or another silo or a different team on the path to production. Um, these are activities that happen, but they don't happen every single time you ship software. They're built into the model by which you ship software. Right. You can some of them you can build into like the test suite that gets run automatically before the test go, before things deploy. Right. Same for security. You can bake in some basic checks, um, and then you know, and then you can have you know the the people who look at it from the other side like more holistically. Our next I have a question. question is, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if that's uh, if that's allowed. Um, we spoke about, um, Charity spoke about people, developers not getting the testing in that, sorry, the um, CI, CD in there quick enough, early enough. I have been on dev teams where there's been, it's been right click publish. I've been on a team where they've dragged and dropped files via FTP. How do you, we start changing those people to think more in in a CI CD DevOps type fashion, those developers who are just like, well, I can just right click publish or they can push to GitHub and, you know, then just deploy that manually. How do we start changing the thoughts and processes? Well, there I think a lot of this comes back to what, 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 what Hannah was saying earlier about um, the easiest thing to do should be the right thing to do, right? The best, quickest, fastest thing to do should be the right thing to do. And, and it should be the easiest or else people are going to do, you know, people are going to do the fast, easy thing. It, it's like, you know, if it takes you 30 minutes to get your code out normally, but you, everybody knows there's like a two minute workaround where you can get it out really quickly if you absolutely have to. Well, that's terrible. Then like with a site's down, everybody's going to use that two minute thing that is not tested that has not been hardened that nobody's been using um and and so you really have to make sure that the fastest thing to do the, the most attractive pathway to engineers is the one that is fastest and easiest and simplest you know like dragging and drop things all around that actually gets really time consuming um, and people do it if they don't have a better easier thing to do that you have shown them and drilled into their heads i think oh, um, every time i 
Oh, please go ahead. Anna. <laughs> Sorry, for anyone who's watching, there is like an ever so slight lag. Yeah. Why we keep talking. There's a de each delay. Other. Yeah. It's rough. <laughs> but, um, all I was going to say is I really, I really experienced that. So it's like, it's great. As I said, like I work with a lot of teams who are building these sort of centralized developer platforms um, and they're approaching it in, in good ways, but I've seen it approached yeah. in, in bad ways, which make it hard to do the right thing. And like Charity said, you know, folks don't, don't want those like high friction experiences because at the end of the day, you can grab a credit card and you can put it into AWS or Azure, or you can put it into GCP and you can be up and running with a PaaS in minutes. You know, if you are putting obstacles in the way of folks getting what they need, they will find another way. And I've experienced that every time I had to do like pipelines myself and I have a good billion tried this, build failed, tried this, deploy failed. And you can go through like GitHub actions for the example. And it will be like 50, 60. And I think, why, why am I bothering with this when I could just go into my ID, right click and deploy from there? And I think that's the mentality that a lot of developers have because like writing Tommel is, is hard. And I think the documentation isn't there quite on a lot of these, these platforms. Uh, and I, I, I shy away from some of these things because it's really hard and really frustrating. So how do we get past that? I think is, is, is a big hurdle. I have a question from Travis Davis. How do you view service ownership with regards to developers owning and operating the services they write? And how does that fit into the DevOps role? I mean, I would, I would love to hear Charity's opinion on this, but I think- I, was um, I feel like I go like first every time, so I'll like try not to do that. The ability to like <laughs> ship like their own code. If you're a developer and you can ship your own code and you have the information you need to know that that has landed safely in production, that's gotta be a lot more fun than the alternative, surely. I think who's gonna, who's gonna resist that as an experience? Um, and like, like I said, I think Charity probably has some great examples of this because I know Honeycomb enables that in such a huge way. But, um, but I think, you know, it's, it's really about making it safe. And when it's safe, it's fun again. You know, it, it, should, be, it should be fun. Absolutely. Okay, it's okay, time to. <laughs> no, okay. wait, wait, wait. We have more to say about this. It is like yes. I feel like the profession of software engineering. It 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 could be it can be so fun, right? It could be if you spend most of your day solving puzzles that are new, novel, interesting puzzles that move the business forward every day. Like it's it's like it's like it's like we all we all win the like Charlie back ever right weighs us down like having to go from from, from here to here to here to here or having the this yes, you know it, it takes a ploy that you know you're to, to approve them so you know therefore for thousand people you know it's just it piles on pilots I just want to say that, that this is one Right is the key, which is that the interval between when you've written the code and when it's live in production, and and we need to like pay that down, get it as small as possible, five minutes, ten minutes, maybe fifteen minutes, no more than that. Because if you're an engineer and you're writing code and you know it's going to be live within ten minutes, you're going to go look at it every single time. If you are writing code, you know, and you're pretty sure it's going to be live at some point in the next day or two, along with you know one to 20 of your other people, you're never going to go look at it. But closing that loop right there, where you're, you're managing your, your code, thinking to how am I going to do it for future, you go look at it, and you look at it through the lens of your instrument, and you see, is it doing what it, it weird? It's in of all bugs. It's our studying about how expensive 
okay, backspace, fast cover. The cost goes up exponentially. It only gets longer and harder and more all trains. And it's all about just like that tight interval and make it as short as possible. I feel like if we if we spent, you know, 20% of our energy consistently paying down the interval and keeping it low, so many good things proceed from it. And if you let that interval grow and expand, like you will start paying constantly for all of the pathologies and all of the terrible things that flow from it. So 15 minutes or bust. <laughs> More on the story. Thanks so much. It's time to say goodbye to a couple of our panelists. They have to move on for to get ready to party. So goodbye, and we'll see you again very soon. Thank you so much for your participation today. Appreciate you. Thanks. See you later. Bye. See you soon. All right. Um, let's go ahead and do, take on the next question. Um, Sorry about that. My sheet's jumping around a little bit. Um, here we are. I'm still meeting. This is from, oh no. Oh, oh no. I'm uh, sorry about that. My, my computer just went dark. Okay. I'm still meeting. <laughs> this is from Mark Yoko. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm still meeting a lot of devs that don't want to be empowered. They would prefer ops to remain somebody else's problem. Should we tr be trying to overcome objections and change minds? Or are we trying to fix a non-problem? You want to go first? <laughs> uh, you see, I'm in the camp where I'm a bit scared of doing releases because I've seen how bad it can go. And mm -hmm. I've been burnt buy it often and I'm like if there's someone who wants to take that on I'm not going to complain however it doesn't mean that I'm not interested and I don't want to do things better uh, it just means that I haven't been empowered I haven't found the the magic source that can let me do this in in, sure. in nanoseconds but that doesn't mean sure. that I don't want that and and I think literally every I've tried all sorts of I've been on teams where we've had big build servers, the latest state of the art that cost a fortune. Uh, this was like before you know a lot of it came mainstream, like m several several years ago. And you know, like our team lead was like, yeah, nobody touches that. It's it's a pig. We we really struggled oh. to get everything running. Nobody else is touching it except me and, and this nominated person. The rest of you be just afraid. make the code and get on with it. <laughs> yes, be afraid. Oh my God. So, uh, you know, at, at that time I was like, okay, that I'm not going to go touch that because I will get my fingers burnt and my knuckles wrapped. Um, and yeah. so if I was empowered to go and use this, um, I mean, I've heard this was a, a, a really prolific tool in, in my tech stack. Um, and, you know, it, when you were applying for jobs, if you had that on your CV, it was like a big uptick. But yeah. and lots of people are like, yeah, this is the best thing. It, it, you know, isn't sliced bread. And I was like, so why is this this guy here telling right. me that it? Right. Oh, my God, no one touch it. Is he gatekeeping? Right. Is that now what I'm learning? Um, and and then this puts it on like the top of my I don't know, six years ago. Totally. And now I'm like, oh, totally. I don't think I want to mm -hmm. do that. Totally. So we're all going past? through this as an industry right now because first of all, like I come from ops and yeah, I've done a lot of gatekeeping in my life. And there was a point in time where, you know, it was kind of reasonable because it was, you know, if you had the monolith, it was up or it was down. <laughs> we didn't have tools mm -hmm. to really inspect what was going on. We had to treat it kind of like a black box. And and that's where the kind of culture of stay out, ops, ops is out. You know, it's not great, but that's where it came from. And it was real. Mm -hmm. Like engineers would come around, do something, not understanding what was going on. We'd have to spend the rest of the day picking up after it. But like as an industry over the past decade or so, like we've been, we've come a long way and we're evolving to a point where, you know, the way I think of it is like, we built this walled garden <laughs> where we're like, stay out. And increasingly we have to build it like a playground, right? Because 
couple points. Increasingly complex, the systems are getting so complicated that no one except the developer who who built it has any prayer of fixing it within a, just a few minutes, right? You have to have mm -hmm. that familiarity with your service. Um, if it's just ops or like an on call, like it could be down for hours. Like, no, you've got to know that shit. Secondly, um, our architectures by by kind of blowing everything up into you know everything the high cardinality dimension now everything's many instead of one, right? It used to be the web, the app, database. Now we've got like services, <laughs> meshes, mm -hmm. and everything. Um, well, because of that, it's easier to have it never be entirely down, right? It's not so binary. It's not up or down. It's like we build in la layers of, you know, degradedness or, or you know, resiliency isn't about making bad things not happen. Resiliency is about letting lots of bad things happen without our customers being impacted, right? So, like, there's there's kind of this trifecta of all these things. There, there's a cultural shift going on. There's a technical mm -hmm. shift going on. There's an architectural shift. And, and I would kind of circle it back to the fact that ops has this well-deserved reputation for masochism, <laughs> for being on call, for just like brute forcing it, you know, just being like, mm -hmm. I've been asleep, I've been awake for, you know, three days straight. <laughs> it's, it's not great. I'm, I'm now <laughs> over my age 30. I, I'm not okay with doing that anymore either. But the point mm -hmm. of inviting developers into being on call with us is not to make everyone be miserable. It's not like you get to become as miserable as us now too. The point is that this is the only way we can actually make it better for everyone so that mm -hmm. nobody has to be masochist and nobody has to go through that so that we can all be adults with families and lives and you know this is the only way that we can make on call categorically better so that it's a dire it's a heart attack when you get paged out of hours it's like it's not just like oh this is you know happens every, it's not like diabetes where you just have to manage it it's a fucking heart attack and you fix it right because it's that big of a deal and it's not just this low level yeah, it's just kind of shitty all the time. We all just have to jump in this grenade. Part of this is raising our expectations for ourselves and our team and making so that's not okay anymore. The, the way that mm -hmm. we invite software engineers in the on-call rotation with us is, is by there's three-way pact between devs, ops, and managers that it's not okay for this to be torture anymore, that we're going to have a higher level of expectation for ourselves and we're all going to make it that way. That means education for devs. That makes means tooling so that, you know, so that it's like guardrails and bumpers, you know, so that it's really hard to do the bad mm -hmm. thing and really easy to do the right thing. It means education, it means observability, it means it means it means managers taking a real personal investment in the fact that it's you know, I, I strongly feel that managers should be evaluated on how often their, their team is getting alerted out of out of hours. And if that number is down, they they should not get a good review, right? It's like we've got the door metrics, right? Uh number of requests, number of latency, um, errors, and time to recovery. And then the fifth is, how often is your team getting alerted, right? And I think that managers should increasingly be evaluated on the health of those five factors so that so that they've got skin in the game too, right? Mm -hmm. So this next question is something you kind of just touched on. Um, should developers have access to the production environment for doing production rollouts? Absolutely. Or should Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh, I, honestly, right. I think it should roll out. It should roll out automatically without anyone interfering. Second best is mm -hmm. the person who made the change should do the push. Um, and third best is anything else. Um, and and there are some people out there who, who will get really. Um, they'll be like, but you know, we have compliance stuff. We have all this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. that we're not allowed to do. First of all, most of that usually isn't quite true. Um, <laughs> um, I encourage you to look, take a very hard second or third look, and, and we can talk about that offline. Um, secondly, um, there are usually ways around it, you know. And thirdly, it's just it's all about ownership, right? It's about having the person be alerted who is best equipped mm -hmm. to make the change that fix it, right? It's all about it's all about cultivating those feedback loops so that they're so that they're good ones and not bad ones. And what do you think are some like baby steps to take to get this cultural shift started? Because it's a whole new mindset. Do you have any advice around that? It is. I mean, the first thing I would usually do is just start by asking you questions, right? About like where you're uh -huh. at and, and like, what are the sacred cows? What are the things that people are really afraid of? Um, but mm -hmm. easy places, ways to start are, I always come back to the deploy process, right? How long does it take you to run all of your tests and deploy your software? How much human, human mm -hmm. intervention does it take? 
can you can you get that interval like can you get the test running down to like 15 minutes make the deploys automatically go out can you automatically change right just can you mm-hmm. get that to be more predictable and more and, and more compact um and mm-hmm. and can, can you focus on instrumentation you should be able to this is the difference between observability and monitoring right observability is you should be able to look at any system ask questions of it and understand what's going on in the inside even if you've never seen this system state before even if it's completely new to you you should be able to figure out what it is just just from first first principles if you can't do that if you don't have observability then a lot of this you can't really do because you're kind of just shooting in the dark you, you don't have the ability to like mm-hmm. identify the problems that you've just caused right so it, it's not like everyone should just rush off to start doing these things without thinking about where are you at what can you handle you know how high you have to be so high to hide this ride we actually i think mm-hmm. we have a pretty decent maturity model for this where you can kind of play choose by pick, choose by choose your own adventure sort of thing where you're like ah we're not so good at this so we should try that next and just kind of try to improve mm-hmm. overall i like that so not being afraid to fail being able to admit mistakes and talk about those and, and improve. absolutely absolutely anytime that you're punishing people internally even if it's a joke mm-hmm. you got to look at that you know if you're if you're mm-hmm. ma- sometimes you've got to like you got to wear the cap of shame all day if you build the you know you really want to strip mm-hmm. all that out of your culture you really want to make it a culture of what been there yeah i've been there yeah. we had a dunce hat when we broke the build oh and in the end oh, i um i just said i'm gonna break the build today because i didn't want the grad to have it uh so they oh, would do oh, it and oh. i would break the build so i could get the dunce hat because it was like we had grads who were kind of like i'm can you can you check this later before before i push it to to build oh. and i'm like sure and then we'd all get notified that you know the the build was broken i'm like it's okay i'm, I'm gonna go push this breaking I'll change right that. now and I'll get that hat that. off you um oh, and it's so sad. it was it's horrible i mean this was a place it's where um, we had a team of testers and we would be like here you go um and mm-hmm. we would release once or twice a year maybe um, and yeah. then the testers would spend six weeks going through and retesting everything. There wasn't any tests. It's what pushed me into doing test driven development. Um, and then yeah. that was after I did nine weeks of regression bug fixing, fixing every <sighs> two of us would put on regression bugs. I don't know why I was given that penance. Um, but nine weeks of that, I thought I just want to die now. Um, and, and that's what pushed me to look at better ways to do things. Um, yeah. And we had, we had like release engineers or I don't know what they were. We, we would give them the code, like, here you go. Mm-hmm. And they would like, yeah, all right. And then they would go and do stuff with it. And that was the last we heard about it. It was, we didn't know, oh, has that change gone out? Ah, shut up. Well, it'll go out when it yeah. goes out. Like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. so, you know, being in those situations, yeah. they're not great. And yeah, looking back, totally. you know, and in those what, situations, what? and in those situations, like you should kind of flip it on your head and not be like picking on the person who you know did something. More like, what in the system made it possible for anyone, someone to make such an easy mistake, right? Like, what is it mm-hmm. that can we just can we add a check for that? Like, no, nothing in your system should be so fragile that you know a, an intern can like destroy the world in a couple of lines of code right that just shouldn't actually be possible and so you should be thanking mm-hmm. them like thank you for finding this vulnerability in our system this shouldn't be possible it shouldn't be this easy to take the system down let's go fix it like yay for you like whole different attitude i love that so ravender's asking a question that we kind of touched on but i just want to make sure i get through all of it so basically this person's asking um should it be op- the operations job to assume the CI/CD, the proper CI/CD pipeline and setup with the proper guardrails by the operation team? I think it's exactly what you just said. Like it's it's somebody's job. I guess that's maybe the question. Whose job is it to make sure it's set up with all the proper guardrails so that no one, no developer, no new grad, no one can mess with it? How does that happen? There's no one right answer because so much depends on who you've got. You know where you were staffed, et cetera. What I would what I would say is though it's everyone's responsibility, right? Like 
management should figure out who can, you know, build the thing. But then, you know, I'm a big fan of having like an on-call rotation for when the build breaks, you know, if you, if you mm-hmm. can't quickly and easily fix it, if it's not obvious to why, why the build broke every single time, just make it an on-call thing, you know, make it part of on-call so that somebody's already responsible for it. And when, when you fix it, then you're supposed to go make it so that it can't happen again. You know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a shared and then ultimately, maybe you're you're big enough as a company that you have a release engineering team who's still in charge of it, but that still doesn't mean they're in charge of fixing your bugs, right? That just means that they're build, they're responsible for building the infrastructure for you to run your shit on, but it's still the responsibility mm-hmm. of the engineer who's committing stuff to like figure out why things are breaking and fix them. You're you're just in charge of like, you know, making it making it so that oh, for example, one thing I really like is when when it when there's a bug goes off or when when the build gets broken, it looks at who who made the last commit and just notify that person in Slack or something instead of like paying everyone like things like that. You know, all, again, it's all about curating feedback loops. Yeah. So we've made it through all the questions so far that have been submitted. Is there any big topic do you, that you think we didn't touch that probably should be addressed today? Not in my, not me. You feel pretty good. Yeah. Any closing remarks? Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, this has been really fun. Um, I hope you join us for party games, but understand if you don't. I know Layla at least is overseas. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm feeling sleepy now. (laughs) (laughs) I have some closing remarks before we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. It's very valuable. And and it's been a pleasure to meet you.